I'm going to show you a little bit about the results we have after 10 years of function of this oxidized surface. The aim of the study was to look into what happens after 10 years of implant survival rate and marginal bone level and soft tissue conditions. We had 46 consecutive patients, 28 females and 18 males. 121 thionite implants were installed. The majority, 113, were the Mark III with a smooth machined neck and thionite, external hex, and eight were MK4, Mark IV implants. Most of the implants were placed in the maxilla, 90 out of 121, and it was a mixture of all locations and singles to full arch restorations. Prosthetic survival rate after 10 years, 92%. So what happened with the ones that failed? Well, we had one full arch bridge that showed multiple porcelain fracture. We could still keep the framework, but new porcelain had to be baked. One full arch bridge framework fractured at the distal cantilever, and we had to make a new bridge. One patient presented with mucositis and marginal bone loss at three implants, which was diagnosed as possible allergic reaction to gold alloy framework, and we had to make a new bridge. And one three-unit bridge became, became a full arch bridge due to implant loss. So on the implant survival side, we ran up to 99.2 after 10 years. All 121 implants were integrated initially and functionally restored. One implant was removed after eight years. And the removed implant got some endodontic issues, meaning that uh, they had an endodontic lesion on the adjacent teeth, tooth, and we couldn't stop that infection. So after eight years, we had to both take out the, the tooth and the implant. Looking at the marginal bone level, after, from baseline to 10 years, 0 0.7 with a standard deviation of 1.3 millimeter. 12 implants showed more than two millimeter of bone loss, and five out of these, 5%, showed more than three millimeter of bone loss after 10 years. So what about the five implants? Well, all patients were smokers and had poor or acceptable oral hygiene. All, patients, all five implants showed bleeding on probing, and roughly about 2% showed pus from the pocket. For the remaining seven implants that showed bone loss, more than two millimeters, no correlation to smoking, oral hygiene, bleeding or pus could be seen. So the conclusion would be that good long-term clinical outcome can be obtained with oxidized implants. And roughly about 2% of examined implants showed more than three millimeter of bone loss, together with bleeding on probing and pus. So how do we obtain long-term results? Good long-term results. First of all, patient selections. Critical. The next critical thing is we need to treat pathology before we rehabilitate. There is a growing trend out there that we pull a tooth that is lost due to periodontitis and we place an implant. And of course we will see some sort of trouble if we don't treat the ongoing pathology. Well-planned and performed surgery. We should engage bone 
around the implant, and we should have keratinized soft tissue. Abutments. What I can see in my material when I look at a bunch of implants is that there is a trend that we have more bone if we have placed a screw-retained abutment compared to if we're taking the bridge down to implant level. Screw-retained versus cement-retained, that has been up to discussion, I think, five or six times today when I've been listening to other speakers. And there's a risk when we cement the crowns that we will actually have some cement down in the pocket and create a mucositis leading perhaps to periodontitis, periimplantitis. Biocompatible prosthetic materials, optimal prosthetic design and fit, not only fit, but design so we can clean around the implants or the patient can clean around the implant. And one more very important thing, individual hygiene maintenance program. We can't just place the implant and let the patient leave, coming back after eight, nine, ten years with problems, then it's actually our fault. Bring them in, bring them in until they know how to brush their implants and teeth. <laughs>